of you here a program that you will follow uh, as we get to know each other. Uh, the program lists six rounds. We're going to do uh, four or five. Uh, but your name will be at the top and then for each round it tells you a location of the numbers that are posted around the room where you will go for that round and then there will be some people who are also there and you'll get to know the people there a little better. Some of you, such as Aiden, are guardians. You always stay in the same place. Others of you will, will wander to some, some combination of locations. Uh, so please first come up and get the paper with your name on it. They're alphabetical by first name. And then go to the location for round zero. To put some concrete code to this. We have main, and we have a variable x integer set to 5, and foo takes in a pointer to an integer p and says assign to the memory location that p points to the value of p plus 1. If we call foo with x, would this code compile? See some nodding, some people saying no, who as a, an explanation for why we're not telling. I mean, it's, it's going to compile because he doesn't really care. Just, yeah. C doesn't really care. That is sort of C's motto. Uh, but even C's very permissive compiler uh, might check to see if types match. Larry Torres, did you have an idea why this might not compile? Um. Maybe it's trying to find a certain memory. So whatever x's value is, they would try to find the memory location at that value. And maybe you would compile if that like, wasn't a valid memory location. So there, there is, whenever we're dealing with pointers, if it's not a valid location of memory, that will cause undefined behavior, likely some sort of crash, but during runtime, not when we compile it. The compiler, like where stuff gets placed in memory, that's determined as the program runs. And so the compiler isn't able to check that necessarily. The, in this case, the compiler would tell us you have something of type integer, and you have a function that takes something of int star, and those don't match. And the compiler wouldn't, wouldn't let us compile the code. But to Owen's point, the compiler is happy to let us just tell it, oh, yeah, x is definitely a pointer to an integer. <laughs> then the compiler is like, oh, yeah, now, now things match, sure. Uh, but this means that the memory address would be 5. Almost certain not going to be a valid memory address. Uh, and we get a segmentation fault. So. We have A here, the ampersand operator is the address of operator. So if we had ampersand here, that will generate a pointer to wherever the value of x resides in memory. So then here, P would be the address where 5 is stored. And this statement would access that address retrieve 5 from it, add 1 to 5, and then write 6 back to that address. So x would be, would be changed here. What are your questions on this? All right. So let's talk about 
a uh, uh, kind of fundamental uh, concept that we're going to be uh, using throughout this course. And that is the idea of a process. So uh, our kind of picture of uh, a process might be something like this. That on our machine, we have uh, the hard disk. Uh, and on that hard disk, we have some programs that have been installed. Maybe a web browser like Chrome, a messaging app like Slack. And so these programs are just sitting sitting on the disk. Uh, that is, their code is just in a file somewhere on the disk. And uh, this whole box here will be our computer. And our operating system is uh, not a process, it's just some code that's currently running on the computer. And it's like the first code that starts running on the computer. And then if we were to start uh, Chrome, that would create a process which is an instance of a running program. So uh, this process is an instance of Chrome, and inside of this process, there's going to be at least one thread, so at least one kind of thread of execution that's executing instructions kind of one after another. And uh, if we zoom in on this, process, we have our thread. And I'm going to draw in this squiggly line just to suggest that it kind of executes some flow of instructions. Maybe other functions are called, or if statements, whatever, but it's kind of executing one instruction after another. And we also have uh, memory, and this is memory that's being virtualized by the operating system, that the process is getting this view of it having its own private memory, but the operating system is coordinating where in the physical memory that data is stored, and the process is keeping track of those kind of different regions of memory that we talked about last time. We have our stack, our heap, data, code, that sort of stuff. And the process also will keep track of its context, meaning uh, kind of information about the current state of the process. So here is this kind of virtual memory that the, the process has, and it also has its kind of virtual CPU which will include kind of the, the values in the registers uh, may be stored inside the process. Why would a process potentially need to store CPU registers? Okay. Well, if, there, if you have like one CPU on your computer and it's switching between multiple processes, then the registers would have to get overwritten by another by that other process. So you need to store them somewhere while it's waiting to get swapped back on. Exactly, exactly. That we're not going to have just one process running on the computer. We're going to have maybe a large number of processes. And these processes might even be instances of the same program. So we might have two different processes, each 
running the code stored in this Chrome program. And in fact, the way that Chrome typically works is each t Chrome tab is a separate process. And this allows the kind of resources for the different tabs to be managed by the operating system. And maybe our, we also have a process in, which is Slack running. Questions on this so far? If the processes have to, uh, I'm assuming you have to reload the registers when switching between processes, isn't that a like a large overhead in switching, or is that not a big deal? You know, uh, yes, this is an excellent point. If every time we want to say switch from running process one to some other process, you have to take all the registers, save them somewhere in memory. Uh, associated with that process and load the registers from somewhere else. So absolutely there is some, some overhead to that. Uh, however, uh, the overhead of doing this, um, there's, a, there's a fixed number of registers. So in that sense it's a constant time overhead. And uh, modern systems will uh, When we switch between processes, this is called a, a context switch. And a modern system might do might do hundreds or thousands of these context switches per second. So uh, in, in we, we do want to be conscious of the overhead of this context switch. Like there is a point at which switching too often will start to have a big impact. But in practice, the overhead is small enough that we can kind of switch, switch as needed. Other questions? All right, so let's look in a little more detail at what is actually inside our process. So the operating system um, needs to keep track of some set of information for each process. So we're going to have a... A process control block, or PCB. This is going to be an an operating system data structure for each currently running process, uh, or for each process that currently exists. Some of them may be. Uh, not their turn to, turn to run, but each process that currently exists. And this is a, a pattern that we're going to see many times where the operating system needs to keep track of some set of things. So we're going to have some data structure, which just usually means a C struct with a bunch of fields in it that keep track of the information we need for each of, each of those things. So I'd like you to, as a sort of uh, design uh, question, take a couple, couple minutes and discuss with your neighbors what things, what are things that we would need in this process control block? What are things that the operating system would need to know about each process? Thank <laughs> you. 
Like if you're, I'm, I'm um, guessing yeah. it has something to do with like if you're doing some form of iteration with like constant value of data, yeah. then you would want to switch off. Because you don't want to pick how much Or at least switch off as little as possible. But then when you get to a place where it's good to switch, does it like take longer to get back into it? Oh, so probably is a pointer to the like, like I don't where really want the all the stuff about the like can be self priority where the stack you can just end up with like every developer to say my end is most important. Yeah, you have to be an OS assigned priority, right? That would be like I'm guessing because you can you can also have like yeah. processes that are native to the computer that the OS is automatically going to prioritize where that actually is everything else that way too. Like sticky keys. All right. <laughs> what's what's an idea that came up in your in your discussion? Lisa. Process ID. A. A process ID. Uh, what would we use a process ID for? What what is what is what would be the purpose? Yeah, we need some way to name each currently running process. And so we're going to do it typically with a number called a process ID or PID for short. And these will also be kind of uh, a global identifier, meaning that no two processes running on the operating system will have the same PID. Elliot? Uh, we also have the idea of like priority. Like if, if there's some way of telling it that like this one process only needs to be refreshed like at least once every 10 seconds, but this other one needs to be refreshed 10 times a second. Yeah, so we might, the operating system might want to keep track. How, uh, how important is each process? Like how, and particularly in terms of CPU, how much CPU, how often does this process need to be run? Uh, in Linux, uh, this is represented by something called nice. Each process has a nice, and this I think ranges from positive 20 to negative 20, meaning if you're very nice, you have positive nice, you don't use much CPU. If you have negative nice, you try and use a lot of CPU. But typically some number indicating like uh, is going to influence the operating system's decision in terms of how much uh, how, how much CPU to get that process. It, how much memory is using? Yeah, we're, we're going to want to keep track of the, the memory. This might include the, the size. There are other things about the memory. Oh, I'm on like a page table. And what is a page table used for? It's used to like correspond the virtual memory to physical memory. Exactly. So we might kind of make it more general. Say so we want something about the location of where we should go find the, the memory. That might be a reference to a page table or some other data structure that would that would get us there. Other things about the memory data or content, like actual data. Uh, you say so what you mean by extra data? Like the actual data that is uh, like using. So we absolutely need the, the the data in this memory stored 
somewhere, but uh, it wouldn't be inside this process control block. Like it would be, there'd be some pointer that we would follow or some memory address that would tell us, okay, this is where the operating system has put the address space, the the memory for this for this process. Other things are our PCV might need. Uh, well, like usage use data on what the process is used. Uh, so, like, which processor it's currently using? You mean? Or like, also, like how, how much CPU is used recently? How much? Or that's also key priority. I might put that under the category of accounting info. We, you know, we might want information about how much uh, resources it's using, how, uh, when was the last time it got to run, that anything that the operating system might want to keep track of for its own decisions or what, or might want to expose to the user if they want to find out things about processes on the system. Lisa? Maybe a creation timestamp. Yeah, we might want to know uh, the creation time or maybe which other process created this process. That's something that we'll, we'll see more about uh, in, a few, in a few lectures, how processes are, are created. David? Um, you can check on threads, like how many threads are you using and what threads are you using. Yeah, we likely you need to keep track of information about the threads that this process can use to, to run. And uh, when we talk about kernels on Monday, we'll actually make a distinction between threads that the operating system manages, which, is, which would be these threads, and threads that the user application manages, which uh, are, are two distinct ideas that, uh, that will, will, the distinction will, will, will be important and we'll talk more about that uh, down the line. So one uh, thing that, yeah, Alan? That is. Yeah, well I absolutely want to know the status of a process. And if we want to think about what are the different states a process could be in, uh, what's, what's uh, one thing a process could be doing? Uh, ready or idle? Yes, so we might say the process is ready. It, can, it could be run, but it's not currently being run. It's kind of. Uh, Sitting there waiting its turn. Are you for it? This state is often referred to as a zombie process, a process that is completed, but we're keeping its data around because some other process might want to check and ask, has this process finished and was it successful? And so those get called zombie processes, but this is, you can think of this as basically completed, but not yet cleaned up. We're keeping its data around in case we need it. Another, yeah, Lisa? Running. Running. That's the thing we want processes to do. And so we could go from running to we have completed and we're now in uh, the zombie state. Whenever that is finally cleaned up, that's when we deallocate our process control block and our, the process would cease to exist. And so uh, if we're running and uh, the process is 
interrupted, then whatever it was interrupted by, that takes place, and then the process is kind of ready to be run again at some point in the future. We start processes kind of moving them from ready to running. That is when we schedule a process to be run. We take it from maybe a list of processes that are ready and start it running. And our last state that I'll put up here is blocked, meaning that the process is waiting for something else to happen. So one common way that we a process might go from running uh, to blocked would be performing some input or output. So we know that accessing the disk, that's very slow. So if a running process starts reading a file from the disk, it's going to be blocked. It's going to be waiting for that data to come back to it before it can continue running. Jeremy? How is block different from interrupted? So, interrupted is something that's coming from outside the process. Whereas this I.O. is something the process is doing that it's now waiting for that to finish before it can continue. So, interrupts are this ability for an interrupt to move a process from running to ready is crucial to be able to do this context switch. Because if we couldn't interrupt a running process, then we'd have to rely on the process to turn over, to like actively turn over control to the operating system. And that would be very bad because then if a process didn't turn over control, we'd have no way to stop it and let something else run. And so these, uh, these interrupts, uh, which we'll, we'll talk more about in the next few, few classes, crucial mechanism for managing uh, context switch and, and processes in general. So we do some I.O. or some system call. Any time the process needs to ask the operating system to do something, interact with the hardware in some way, it's going to be blocked, waiting for that operation to complete before it can continue running. And when that operation, whatever it's waiting on, finishes, that will also trigger an interrupt to let the system know, hey, this operation has finished, you can now make that pro that process is now ready to be run again. Ellie. Is there ever a scenario where a process could go from being blocked to just being a zombie? Like, you know, you were waiting for something and then some other processes, like, just don't bother, just, you know, end? Yes, absolutely. Uh, a process could be running, could uh, try to access invalid an invalid memory address, this triggers a page fault. The operating system takes over, determines that it's not recoverable, and terminates the process. Um, yeah, so uh, you could, if the uh, process did something it wasn't allowed to do, blocks and then terminates. Other questions? One other thing I want to add to this uh, data that we're keeping inside our process control block are information about, to be more specific, open files. Since a process is going to need to, uh, the process is going to need to be able to create, read, write files uh, in the file system. And 
Uh, but that involves interacting with hardware that user processes are not allowed to just do whatever they want. So when a process wants to do something with files, it's going to have to ask the operating system. And so the operating system needs some way to keep track of what files a process has open and some way to provide a mechanism for that process to interact with those files. So a common way to do this is something else that's uh, inside our, our process will be and an array of pointers where each of these is going to point to some file structure, some, again, data structure the operating system is using to keep track of information about a currently open file. And we have this array of pointers as part of our process control block. And the neat thing that we can do is what we'll give to the process in terms of how it can interact with these files is we'll just give it the indices of this array. So let's say you have files 0 and 1 here that are open. And if you want to do something with this file, you do something with 0. And if you want to do something with this file, you do something with 1. And these numbers here are called file descriptors. So, in fact, when you, on Linux, when you ask Linux to open a file, you give it the string that's the file name, and it's going to return to you an integer, which is just an index into this array to tell you, okay, which pointer should you follow to get the information for that file. David? Um, can processes interact with each other using kind of like the same idea of arrays of pointers? We have like pointers from two different processes. So, in terms of processes interacting with each other, that's limited by the fact that they have, I, that they don't share any memory. So there are some ways they can inter interact, but it's fairly constrained, and uh, we'll we'll talk more about that uh, later. But for example, they could both have opened the same file. One could be writing to the file, the other could be reading from it, for example. Um, and this approach allows the operating system to make optimizations such like if multiple processes open the same file, we can have them point to the same file structure. Other questions? Oh, so, so, so like, the, does this array of pointer, will it be changed? But like, can, can they shrink if you delete some file? Because I can see that if you're actively modifying this thing, like the processes can get confused. So, it's a good question. How does this get changed? Does it grow or shrink? So in this representation, representation that I've drawn up here, this array is of fixed length. And so we've actually said the process can have at most however many slots are in this array, that many open files. And if one of these pointers is null, we know that that file is that file, that slot is not currently being used. So I'll either have one of these slots point to a file structure or have it be null to say that that one isn't being used. If all the pointers are being used, would you just start a new process? 
So I think it's an interesting design question. What should you do if this fills up? Uh, you might think, uh, well, if we make it really some very large number, then it's fine if we cap a process. Uh, maybe we don't have it be an array. Maybe we have it be some sort of linked list, so then we can add new uh, elements to the list and remove them as, as we go. Uh, you will implement a file descriptor table in lab one, and uh, the recommended design is to use the fix, a fixed length array, but uh, as you identify, that's, that's, there's always trade-offs and there are definitely downsides to that approach. 